Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I'm Randy Aki. I'm a Rubenstein Fellow here at uh, Brookings Institution. I'm also an Associate Professor of Public Policy at UCLA. Uh, thank you all for coming here uh, and participating in our, our, our really exciting and interesting uh, uh, workshop that we're having today on data disaggregation for, to help inform policy. Uh, uh, I want to acknowledge before we get started the, the, the lands that we are standing on, the uh, Piscataway and the Anacostia people, the ancestral homes of those people before we get started. Uh, and uh, again, welcome all of you here to Brookings. Our, our welcome speaker uh, is uh, Bill Frey, who's a senior fellow in the Metropolitan Program here at Brookings. Uh, he's a well-regarded demographer known for his research on urban populations, migration, immigration, aging. Uh, his book is uh, available also here at the Brookings Bookstore, Diversity Explosion, How New Racial Demographies Are Retaking America. Uh, and he'll show at you actually some of these really exciting uh, uh, data uh, today. And he's worked for decades in this really exciting area, uh, primarily at the University of Michigan, but also um, uh, amongst other places and had m over 200 publications uh, and other books as well uh, on this topic. So without any further ado, uh, please welcome Bill Frey. Okay, thank you, Randy. It really is a great pleasure for me to be here for this event because I think it's a really a foundational event for this kind of research. Um, you know, data disaggregation as a means to improved health research and policy making. Uh, this, this is probably the, the uh, penultimate uh, workshop on this. People are going to look at this workshop and draw from this workshop and event going forward on, the, on this area. Now, as Randy says, I'm a demographer, and what demographers do is we disaggregate all the time. I've spent my life disaggregating, and so this is kind of uh, something right up my alley. But I do think this is an opportunity for people, researchers, and policymakers to come together to try to think of ways that it's best to disaggregate data and methodologies that can be used with the disaggregation of that data in order to address important policy issues going forward. And I think the disaggre disaggregation message is especially important now and going forward because we're becoming a much more racially diverse society, not just racially diverse, diverse in all kinds of other ways in terms of gender and sexual orientation, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, mobility, in terms of generational change, and then all of that interacting with geography, which is another way of disaggregating everything. So I think when we look at this going forward, we're going to have a better idea of how we can shape policies, whether it be for health and well-being or social mobility or inequality, uh, by having a better data set, a more informed data set, uh, and ways to look at these data to be able to come up with better policy solutions. Now, I realize the people here today are all experts in various areas of research uh, being at economics, sociology, public health, political, political studies, and so forth, as well as data science, uh, which are all very important. So, but nonetheless, Randy said I could have a few minutes to talk about some big picture demographic trends, uh, especially with respect to racial and ethnic diversity in the United States, which I think is important to keep in mind as a backdrop uh, for all the kinds of research that you're doing. So right up here is uh, something from the Census Bureau. These are population projections going from 2015 to 2060 uh, for different race and ethnic groups. Not the very detailed race and ethnic groups that you're going to hear about later today, uh, but the broad ones. Uh, and as you can see, over this 45-year period, people who are identify as more than one race, and that's going to be a bigger group probably than even the Census Bureau projects as we go forward, uh, will increase by more than 300% over this 45-year period. People who are, say they're Hispanics, people who say they're Asians, and in this case including also people who are Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, will also perhaps double over this 45-year period. African Americans will increase by 37 percent. Uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives will increase by 14 percent, but there's actually going to be a small decline in the non-Hispanic white population going forward. Uh, and part of the reason is the kind of aging of that white population, and that's kind of underlined by looking at this chart. Now this chart sort of makes the point that we're becoming more racially diverse from the bottom of the age structure and going upward. And what you see here is each of those bars represent a different age group. The lowest bar for the under age five age group, the upper bar by the 80, age 85 and over age group. 
uh, in 2015 where these numbers were taken, that under age five age group was about half non-Hispanic white, about 26% Hispanic, 13% black, 5% Asian, and then other races being that other group at the end. Much more diverse than, of course, the 85 and over age group. But the idea is uh, that this is going to change over time. Part of the dynamics, of course, is that the white population, the non-Hispanic white population, is aging, uh, meaning proportionately fewer women in their childbearing ages, uh, meaning smaller fertility among uh, those groups, whereas, say, the Hispanic population uh, is younger, and uh, largely because of uh, maybe 30 or 40 years of immigration. Today, most of the Hispanic babies most of Hispanic growth is due to natural increase, the excess of births over deaths rather than immigration, but that younger age structure of Hispanics comes from that, those decades of immigration, and that helps to beef up their part of the younger part of the population. So if you think about this going forward, here's a chart which goes from left to right, young to old, uh, shows the racial and ethnic make makeup of age group 0 to 9, 10 to 19, up to 70 and over in 2020. This is the result we might see from the 2020 census when the results come out. And again, you can see in this chart, probably all millennials will be under age 40. Millennials and post-millennials are the under age 40 age group, which are much more racially diverse than these older age groups going forward. Now, if we push this up to 2035, 15 years later, we have the same kind of pattern, but that kind of diversity moves up into the somewhat older age groups. By that, millennials will all be over age 40 in 2035, and all the rest of those younger people are going to be post-millennial generation. Uh, folks. So you can see, especially if you're dealing with health issues, uh, a lot of it has to do with what's going on in the younger years, uh, how you're going to deal with people's issues and, you know, expenses and opportunities, the kind of research that needs to be done to the extent they are centered on different racial and ethnic groups differently. This is going to be very different in the younger population going forward than we've seen in the past, and the able to disaggregate the population in these, in these ways is going to be very important. Not only is the demographics changing, but so is the geography. Uh, here is a map of the U.S. of 3,100 counties in the U.S. Uh, that shows which non-white racial ethnic groups are overrepresented compared to their national uh, percentage. Uh, so you see a lot of those counties in the south are red because there is a higher percentage of blacks in each of those counties than there is nationally. And a lot of the counties in the southwest and on the west coast uh, are either heavily Hispanic or higher Asian percentages than national, or two or more races are in there than higher than the national race. Uh, and then uh, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives, a lot of the upper Midwest, Upper Great Plains, uh, I think Oklahoma's in there, and also the state of Alaska is in there. And there's a swath of counties in there, it's a pretty big swath of counties, where none of these non-white groups are overrepresented. But it turns out they're kind of small, a lot of them are small, sort of sparsely populated counties. Only about 30% of the U.S. population lives in those white counties. All the rest of them live in counties where other racial and ethnic groups are higher than the national percentage. So, you know, if you think about this, how are you going to deal with particular areas where there's an interaction with these particular race and ethnic groups that have various levels of composition in those areas? And it's spreading. Here's a map which shows where the new Hispanic destinations are. They're those blue dots, the metropolitan areas with those blue, uh, sorry, green dots. Uh, and many of them are in the Midwest, many of them are in the parts of the country that don't already have big Hispanic populations, but very rapid Hispanic growth, places like Omaha, Nebraska, or Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, very high Hispanic growth. So this is a spreading out. We're seeing a diversity in the United States that's starting from the bottom of the age structure and going up, and starting from these kind of melting pot areas and moving inward. And I think this is what we have to pick up in our surveys and our methods as we move ahead. Now, as I said, these are crude categories we've used here. You're going to hear today about more detailed categories among Hispanics, among Asian Americans, and among other groups. Uh, and we're also going to hear about what's going on in different kinds of geography. The economist Raj Chetty has shown a lot about what you can do at the county and the neighborhood level, interacting with these demographic variables uh, to understand outcomes going forward and to the extent that this can be applied even more greatly if we have very good data, uh, even better than the kind of data that he's been able to use, which is pretty much state of the art at this point, where you can link various administrative records with surveys, uh, not just randomly, but very informed by the research, by the policy issues, by the policy questions, 
And I think this is a real challenge, I think, that we're going to be facing as a research community, as a policy community going forward, because we have all these opportunities. Uh, if you think of all the data that are collected by administrative data, by government agencies and other, other places, be able to link them with surveys. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit, but we have, there are costs involved, and uh, those have to be uh, understood too, and I think that's going to be part of the discussion today. And of course, there's the other issue, and that has to do with privacy. Uh, you know, it's an issue now that federal agencies, especially the Census Bureau, is going to be looking ahead toward how they're going to disseminate their data so as not to violate certain privacy principles. And that, I think, is going to be some long discussion between the research community and the uh, sort of various government agencies. And hopefully, uh, you know, with the idea that this is not just for research per se, but research to be able to inform policy, to inform the next generations of Americans, to have this kind of data to do sophisticated, uh, you know, informed research is going to be very important going forward. So these are the kinds of discussions uh, I think you're going to have today. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to sort of start the ball rolling with this particular group of people here. Uh, people are going to look back at this conference as, as, as the beginning of a discussion that is going to continue uh, and, and be very fruitful. So I'm happy to welcome you all to Brookings. I look forward to a very productive day. And uh, we'll now turn over the program to Richard Reeves, who is going to lead the panel uh, coming up here uh, on critical needs for data disaggregation for race and ethnic groups. Why do we need to disaggregate? Richard Reeves is a senior fellow in the Economic Studies program here, and he's also the director of the Future of the Middle Class Initiative. I'm sure you've heard a lot about Richard because he does a lot of cutting-edge research, cutting edge research, and he's going to lead the panel as they come up to the stage. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.